Generally speaking, Western esotericism is often thought to be largely downstream of Neoplatonism, the system of emanationism developed by Plotinus and his philosophical heirs, especially Iamblichus and Proclus. And, to a significant degree, that's true, especially in the mystical traditions of Western Christianity via Pseudo Dionysius, Sufism and Islam, and Kabbalah and Judaism. However, much of the theory of Western occultism, that is to say that one can harness hidden, hence occult powers in the cosmos, actually has a separate and rather surprising philosophical origin. It's to be found in Stoicism. Overwhelmingly known for their rationalism, their materialism, and famous for their notion of apatheia, or the extinction of the pathe, or the emotions, or the passions, Stoicism contributed, I think, three quintessential elements to the development of Western occultism. That is to say, ancient, sagely proximity to divine wisdom of nature, the concealment of that wisdom in religious texts, along with the method by which those secrets are to be uncovered or revealed, what the Stoics called allegoresis, and the cosmic system of connections, or the web of correspondences, known by the Stoics as sympatheia, or the system of sympathies, by which all of reality is united into one vast cosmobiology. Let's explore the Stoic background, a Western occultism. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica and check out my other content on topics in esotericism, including various curated playlists on various topics. Also, if you want to support this work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube for free, I'd hope you consider supporting my work on Patreon with a one-time donation with a handy-dandy little super thanks option below the video, or maybe by picking up one of our very metal shirts over at the merch store. You can find that on the store tab on the channel. But now, let's turn to the esoteric dimension of Stoicism. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. All right, just a couple caveats before we get started. The first is that this episode is not meant to be a primer or an introduction to Stoic philosophy. I'm assuming that you're a little familiar with the overall philosophical system itself. Unfortunately, Stoicism, like Western esotericism, are both represented very poorly online, just frankly misrepresented most of the time. So honestly, tread carefully out there looking for Stoicism content. I mean, the amount of dude bro become undefeatable by not feeling your feelings like a real alpha so you can work 100 hours a week to make your tech boss rich stoicism that populates a lot of youtube is as regrettable as it is cringe a good touchstone for judging stoicism content on the internet is that if you don't hear a discussion of what strong assent to cataleptic fantasiae means they're not talking about stoicism you may want to go watch or read something else. That's literally the most important concept in historical Stoicism. It links together their ethics, their physics, their epistemology, their logic. Every catalepsis is the core of their idea. If you're curious, by the way, Tad Brennan's The Stoic Life, Emotions, Duty, and Fate is, in my opinion, the absolute best text for understanding real historical Stoic philosophy with a critical eye, but also with real analytic rigor. And it is absolutely worth a read if you're interested in stoicism but the second caveat is more a bit methodological part of the problem with studying stoicism is that virtually all of the foundational philosophical texts produced by the early school in greek they're all lost basically chrysippus for instance the second scholarch and really the true philosophical systematizer of stoicism as a philosophy allegedly wrote over 700 books Diogenes Laertius says that, so we should take it with a grain of salt, but he wrote a lot. 
nothing survives, just fragments. And the same is true for Zeno, Posidonius, Panaetius, etc. We have precious little of what they wrote, and that's all gathered together in the still actually untranslated four-volume Storicorum Veterum Fragmenta, though the long Sedley edition of Hellenistic philosophical text does provide access to really important key Stoic text and translation. So we're left to work with fragments, and especially important for this episode, the uptake of Stoic philosophy into the Roman period, primarily in folks like Cicero. So all talk of Stoicism as a philosophical system, not that all Stoics agreed, they certainly didn't, Panaetius and Posidonia certainly didn't, this is always going to be a bit of forensic reconstruction on the part of scholars using those remaining fragments in Greek and the Roman uptake of Stoicism. Of course, with the exception of the Roman Stoics themselves, like Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. Though, to be honest, they're much more interested in the ethics of being a Stoic rather than actual philosophical systemizing that really makes the whole system work in the first place. But given these two caveats, let's begin at the beginning for the Stoics with their theory of the first human beings, but also, and importantly, the first sages. As you may know, the Stoics held that the universe went through a cycle of periodic conflagrations, or ekpyrosis, by which all matter returned to its primy, fiery state, only for the cosmos as we know it to emerge from those ontological flames. And in ancient philosophy, there was a real debate about the nature of the first humans to emerge in that process. Aristotle, probably polemicizing against Plato, famously held that the first human beings were oi tu contes. They were of no account. There wasn't anything interesting about them. That is to say, they were fundamentally unlearned, kind of tabula rasa, blank slates of people, if you will, that had to do all the hard work to learn about the world around them, to learn about nature, and ultimately to do philosophy, which resulted in the apex of that process, who, of course, Aristotle held himself to be. Humility was very clearly a virtue of Aristotle. The Stoics, however, following Plato to a significant degree here, held a rather different position. Rather, as Cornutus' handbook actually has it in section 35, that the ancients, primarily Homer he's thinking of here, were actually able to, quote, understand the nature of the cosmos and had the ability to philosophize on it by means of symbols and allegories. The word there is symbolon kai enigmaton, enigmaton. This idea he probably picks up from the star of this episode, basically, Posidonius, who held that the first humans born from the earth were much superior to the present ones in means of intelligence, as though they possessed some further perceptive faculty. They applied the acumen of their mind to the divine nature and conceived of some divine powers. That's from Posidonius, as related by Sextus Empiricus in Adversus Mathematicos 928. Thus, the Stoics held that the first human beings, rather than being of no account, as Aristotle had it, a blank slates, were profoundly able to engage in philosophy and the study of nature. So much so, it's as if they had senses and perceptive abilities far superior to ours today. They were far more intelligent. Posidonius argues. Thus, they were able to grasp the nature of the cosmos and their place in it cataleptically. Cataleptically. Which is to say that they could and did comprehend reality without failure and without doubt. By the way, that's why the Stoic sages discount the pathé or the emotions. The Stoic sage only assents to those impressions coming at them which are capable of being eternally true or impressions which are cataleptic, capable of being grasped. As we'll see, chief among truly cataleptic impressions is the reality of fate, of which there, there's no escape from fate. As Seneca famously said, you can walk with fate or she can drag you. Kicking and screaming changes nothing, and the good and the bad events that befall us and the passions they inspire within us are, for the Stoics, a diaphora. They're necessarily matters that are indifferent to the sage. Why cry over spilled milk? Thus, you don't repress or suppress one's emotions the way that dude, bro, alpha, sigma, or whatever Greek letter nonsense style 
The Stoic sage simply never gives strong assent to non-cataleptic impressions, and the externals and their accompanying passions are, by definition, just a matter of indifference for the Stoic sages, though your mileage may vary. Catalepsis aside, the core idea here is that the Stoics held that the first humans had a deep and powerful understanding of the fundamental nature of reality. They even claim that the first language, a form of onomatopoeia, literally emerged from this profound understanding and closeness to nature, to divine nature, such that language and nature nearly perfectly represented each other in this archaic period of human development. And as we'll see, this Stoic philosophy of language will inform their searching use of etymology as a philosophical tool. Etymology is going to be a core concept in how they're going to mine out ancient texts. Of course, this idea echoes sentiments from Plato and the Cratylus, and will go on to deeply inform Western esotericism philosophy of language more generally. This is the idea that language and ontology remain deeply connected, sasur be damned, hence the power of certain words, signs, and languages. And I've done a pretty deep dive into these issues in Western esotericism's philosophy of language, especially as it's taken up into Renaissance Hermetic philosophy in the famously obscure Monus Hieroglyphica and the so-called angelic Enochian language of Dr. John Dee, which are great laboratories for understanding Renaissance theories of language and Hermetic philosophy of language in general, if you want to check those out. Thus, for the Stoics, the ancients both understood reality better than we do now, with the exception of the rare Stoic sage roaming around out there in the wild, and they had a superior language to express those truths because of the close connection of this archaic language with nature itself. Again, also remember that nature is divine for the Stoics. Thankfully, though, for us non-sages, the ancients preserved these primordial truths in three forms, as we're told by Chrysippus. In Phusis, by which this to say philosophy, specifically philosophy of nature, in nomoi, or laws which govern the proper relationships of human beings with one another, and finally, and most importantly in many ways for the Stoics, in muthoi, in religious myths. Now, we have to deconstruct a little bit about the way that we use the word myth here. We typically mean myth as something like a man-made, made-up story, as in the, I don't know, the myth of the Loch Ness Monster or the Bermuda Triangle or something like that. Here we should understand the word myth as it was used by the ancient Greeks as being a narrative involving divine beings and importantly containing important truths, even if it's not literally true, as we'll see in just a minute. The pious Stoic Cleanthes, whose hymn to Zeus actually does survive, thank goodness, argues that these myths are of decisive importance for philosophy because poetic and musical modes are superior to mere logoi, or narrative discourse. Indeed, he argues, the superior modes of poetry and music, again, the form by which ancient myths like Hesiod and Homer were encoded, best convey the divine greatness of reality, and they also, quote, reach the truth of the contemplation of divine reality. So, boat one for myth, he even refers to the cosmos itself as a vast mystery or mysterion, and likens philosophy as a sacred priesthood whereby one is initiated into the telestai, that language is the very goal of the great esoteric cults of the ancient Greek world. The argument of the early Stoics here is kind of shocking, given that they're typically and wrongly associated with a sort of detached hyper-rationalism, a la the new atheist types. Here, the language is of deep and profound piety, and not just piety in an abstract way, but piety informed by religious myth in practice as a kind of esoteric initiation similar to the mystery cults of Eleusis, Demeter, or Dionysius. They're using the language of the mystery cults, and the very founders of Stoicism are arguing that the most ancient myths, specifically of Hesiod and Homer, contain best, best, the truth of philosophy and an ultimate understanding of the fundamental nature of the cosmos and of divine realities by extension. This is shockingly akin and probably one of the foundational notions of philosophical and religious perennialism and the concept of the Prisca Theologia. 
That is, core concepts in Western esotericism that all religions or all spiritualities contain a core record of deeply universal philosophical and spiritual truths which were pristine at some point way back in remote antiquity, like with the first people for the Stoics. Now, in Western esotericism, these sources would include folks like Hermes Trismegistus, Moses, Zoroaster, Shem, a whole bunch of other people. But the core concept of this goes back to Stoicism and their theory of the first human being's proximity to divine truth with the access to that metaphysically powerful language. But there's just, a, just one problem. The myths don't at all appear to be doing that. They're stories about bloody wars, love, leering suitors, one-eyed monsters, powerful sorceresses, flying, singing bird people, face-launching ships, a great many people getting stabbed by various pokey things, and a host of gods that are anything other from stoic moral exemplars. Just where are these fundamental truths about reality and these otherwise ancient Greek soap operas. Of course, this pesky problem of the myths had already come up in Greek philosophy, most famously in Plato's Republic. If you remember, if we're going to train people, especially the people that will, whose specialty it will be to kill outsiders, i.e. the auxiliaries in the Callipolis, it's really important to provide them with a religious education so that, you know, they kill the right people. But the myths, of course, are full of all kinds of morally dubious lessons. I mean, do you really want a bunch of soldiers emulating Zeus? No. No, 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 you, you don't want that. So what do you do? Well, Plato just goes full-on blasphemy. You censor the myths. You censor them to teach the lessons the guardian class decides needs to be instilled in the population. In fact, you just, you just make up new myths. Make up new ones, like the myth of the metals, to prevent anyone from questioning, much less altering their station in society. Plato, great totalitarian. Of course, this would be akin to a modern politician editing the Bible or the Quran to fit their social agenda, a really shocking outrage that would never ever happen. No politician would ever cherry pick the Bible or the Quran to get what they want. I mean, Thomas Jefferson would never, ever edit the Bible to get rid of all the miracles and the resurrection of Jesus because he thought that that was superstitious nonsense. He wouldn't do that. No president would do that. But to be sure, Plato's admonition to censor the myths actually struck most of the ancient populations as it would strike many people now, as completely morally outrageous, heretical, and blasphemous, and it seems to have struck the Stoics similarly. Remember, Cleanthes? Pretty pious dude. And there are secrets of reality in them myths, so can't censor them. So the Stoic answer isn't going to be to throw them out on all the problematic sections and, I don't know, cancel the myths. In fact, their answer represents a positively tectonic shift in the history of hermeneutics, or the art of reading texts. For the Stoics, the answer is that below the literal reading of the myths, all the icky parts, is a hidden dimension of the text containing those important and ancient truths which can only be accessed by which they d developed and adapted as allegoresis. Now, the Stoics weren't absolute pioneers here. Uh, Theogenes of Regium and Pharisees of Syros actually go back to the 6th century BCE, and they were attempting to allegorize away some of the more outrageous stuff, morally outrageous stuff in the myths already. Really, Homer's already kind of doing some allegorizing in the myths as well, and the Derveni Papyrus is a philosophical commentary on the Orphic hymns, already doing something like the Stoics are going to really systematize. Now, I've done an entire deep dive on the Derveni Papyrus, which is an absolutely amazing text and the oldest European manuscript ever found. If you want to check that out, I'm not exaggerating. It is a shockingly amazing, mysterious, and a wonderful text that's virtually unknown, except for by specialists. If you're interested in this sort of stuff, you need to check out that episode of the Divini Papyrus. It's really, really interesting. But what the Stoics do here is decisively important. They argue that hidden beyond the literal meaning of the text are not only meanings, but systematic, systematic philosophical truths about the nature of reality hidden just beneath the surface of these myths. 
And again, while they had precursors, they were going to really systematize this. Zeno of Ketium, the founder of Stoicism, would produce philosophical commentaries on Hesiod and Homer to reveal these secrets. Cleanthes would even go so far as to produce new mythic poetry and deepen the analysis of allegoresis as he developed it, as I mentioned earlier. Chrysippus of Soloi, really the second founder of Stoicism, would further theorize allegoresis and deploy it upon the religious hymns of Hesiod, Homer, Musaeus, and Orpheus, discovering a range of truths about physics, ethics, theology, logic, etc., all of which, of course, agreed with Orthodox Stoicism. Later Stoics like Diogenes of Babylon and Apollodorus of Athens and Crates of Malice would probe again into the myths using etymological analysis, the meaning of root words in Greek, most of which are not accurate, to mine out truths from logic to astronomy to geography using the tools of allegoresis. Sadly, virtually none of these works survive. The only example of the Stoic tradition that survives into a complete work from antiquity is the Theologiae Graecae Compendium of Lucius Aeneas Cornutus, written during the reign of Nero, way later. However, by the first century BCE, Philo of Alexandria would begin using the techniques of allegoresis developed by the Stoics to mine out from the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament creating a synthesis of Israelite revelation and Platonic philosophy that would be the necessary stepping stones for the development of Christianity. And those techniques, allegoretic techniques, would be used by early Christians who would use it to find their Messiah in the tools and the scriptures of the Hebrew Bible. And it would be Origen's Treatise on First Principles, which I think is probably the first true philosophical masterpiece of Christianity, that would secure allegory as a veritable means to read scripture through Christian history. Of course, I don't think I can overemphasize the importance of this for the history of Western esotericism, or really just the history of Western literary criticism for that matter, which relies on hidden meanings and texts, symbols, mathematics, geometry, and of course, nature itself. And that brings us to our final contribution of Stoicism to Western esotericism, how their theory of nature will give rise to the theory of occult forces in reality all around us and their manipulation as nothing less than a theory of magic. That the Stoics would profoundly influence the world of Western esotericism is, well, it's a bit ironic considering that the school itself was fundamentally and unwaveringly rationalist materialist, even physicalist, physicalist in its overall philosophical outlook. For the Stoics, everything that existed was a soma, a body, a physical body, specifically a kind of fire diffused through really as the cosmos itself. Their materialism was so radical that they denied even the existence of effects. <laughs> the knife cuts the flesh, as the example goes, but only the knife and the flesh are real. They're composed of bodies. The being cut as a predicate, as an effect, is merely a lecta. It's just a thing said, which merely subsists and is thus sub-ontological in nature, the kind of ghostly existence of the event itself. Gilles Deleuze actually deals masterfully with the ontology of the lecta in his really great book, The Logic of Sense, if you can understand it. Reality, as this fiery breath or panuma, is also alive, rational, and totally causative as the divine logos, or God, used interchangeably with nature for the Stoics. Because this substance of reality is everywhere diffused, but also rational, the system of ever-present imminent causation, recall, effects are just subsisting lecta, this binds reality into one vast cosmo-biological totality, whereby everything is linked to everything else by a web of what the Stoics called sympathia, or the sympathies. Or, as Cicero puts it in De Natura Diorum, the cosmos is bound together in a, quote, sympathetic, continuous affinity of things, joined together in its breathing. Vero tanta rerum consintiens conspiras continuara cognatio. Indeed, the Stoics describe all of reality as cohered as a kind of hexis, the way they use the term, by a tonos, a tension of the divine rational panuma, or the breath, 
or as Cicero has it, uno divino et continuitato spiritu, one divine and all-pervasive breath, pneuma. That reality was so fundamentally a system of divine rational causes, this also meant for the Stoics that nature was not only bound together by interconnected causation, but that divine reason was communicated through signs in nature, which could only be read or interpreted correctly by those skilled in natural philosophy. The most famous of those signs were the configuration of the stars, which acted as signs for coming events. Of course, the Stoics were famously radical determinists, and they viewed fate as the optimal and necessary system of imminent causes by which the divine reason expressed itself. The world, the world could be no different than it is because it just is divine reason expressing itself. Though rather than the stars causing events in the sublunar world, they were taken by the Stoics to be signs of what was about to come, just in the same way that a, a shift in the wind might mean an incoming storm, thus allowing the farmer to protect to save their crop, but also for the Stoic to prepare their will for what was coming. The task of the Stoic, of course, was to align their inner will with the pervasive divine will, rejecting opinion, doxa, and emotions, pathe, about the externals. The incidentals, again, are just a diaphora. They're indifferent to the vast divine imminent totality. Of course, the idea that a vast system of sympathies and antipathies pervading reality constituting nature as a means to grasp the hidden divine will is a... It's a fundamental component of Western esotericism. In fact, the system of correspondences is one of the key elements from Anton Fievre. Though this will be developed much further than the simple idea that the web of sympathies can not only be read as a to reveal secrets from the book of nature, though the Stoics never call it that, but that the system of sympathies can be rigorously analyzed as a system of correspondences, revealing hidden occult relationships between things which can be accessed and manipulated by the learned or the magus. This conception of nature, replete with hidden occult relationships and correspondences bound together metaphysically through a system of sympathies, is foundational for Western magic, from folk cunning magic to astral magic a la Picatrix to high ceremonial magic with all its ritual furniture, cloaks, gems, swords, and magical incantations. Those incantations, by the way, are often alleged to be in an archaic language precisely along the lines that Stoic philosophy of language articulated earlier, that more archaic languages are somehow closer to the divine world and divine speech. This would even lead to the Paracelsian idea that the divine, that God had left a kind of divine imprint or clue in every single mineral, plant, animal, body part, and celestial object as a kind of signature as he put it, for the alchemist to discover, decipher, and ultimately empower themselves and others with. From the natural signs of nature and the heavens to the table of correspondences that are used in magical manuals down to this day, the underlying philosophical logic is one of occult sympathies, one ultimately pioneered by the Stoics. As you've probably noticed, Stoicism has really come into vogue in the past several years, though I think for a ton of bad reasons. I mean, it's certainly more than a bro cope for when your crush turns you down. I mean, those same bro cope Stoics often come to the completely rational, divine position that she was ugly anyway, and that all women are somehow evil, because that's definitively, definitely Stoicism and not laughably pathetic. I, I hope I've shown that Stoicism is not only a fantastically innovative and systematic ancient philosophy, but it also played an absolutely decisive role in the development of Western occultism and Western esotericism, a role that's often overshadowed by Neoplatonism. In fact, Middle Platonism and the Stoic Posidonius and really Philo of Alexandria, I support her, I think are really the MVPs in a lot of what becomes Western esotericism. Way more so in a lot of ways than Plotinus, who again was more important in the development of mysticism, a distinct but related development. Again, if you want a really solid presentation of real, not 
dude, bro, don't feel your feelings, historical stoicism, I'd pick up a copy of Brennan's A Stoic Life, though if you really wanted to get into the weeds of Stoic physics, which is the stuff around divine fiery breath and the web of sympathia, the oldie but goody Stoic Physics by Sembersky is absolutely your best bet, though I have to admit it's pretty, it's pretty technical. As I mentioned also, Long and Sedley have the best collection of Stoic fragments in translation, but the Stoic Reader by Hackett is also just a must-have for all your Stoic needs. I love Hackett. You hear that, Brill? Hackett. More episodes to come on this connection for the relationship of philosophy and esotericism because I just love this stuff. Until then, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.